Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Not a lecture, a talk. I'm very glad to see so many <coughs> Parachute Regiment Association people here. But, on the other hand, I've got to be very careful what I say, because they know me too well. The talk is about the action of a battalion which started off from this country not far from here, with its full strength, and which <coughs> ended up with a very small part of that strength to do a job, and which did it. In the spring of 1944, I was a major, second in command of the 9th Parachute Battalion, and I was on leave in London. I was ordered by telephone to come back to Bulford to be met at Andover by my car and to go straight to the Brigadier, Brigadier James Hill, who I expect a lot of you know. He told me that I had been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, that I was then in, now in command of the 9th Parachute Battalion, as the then CO had been posted elsewhere. <clears throat> he also said that the invasion was about to take place and that the 9th Battalion had got what he considered to be the worst job of the whole of the Airborne Forces and probably of all the armies, i.e. the capture of a battery at a place called Nerville. I was then taken off to a farmhouse with a model <clears throat> where I was locked inside and I looked at this model and I thought I can't see the point of there being an Atlantic wall and jumping over that wall and landing all your troops outside a fort. So my first decision was to put somebody inside as well as outside. Now the general plan of the invasion was that the airborne forces was to be on the left flank in order to stop the Germans coming and <coughs> kicking the seaborne forces up the backside. There were three very important tasks. The most important was the capture of the Pegasus Bridge by my great friend John Howard, who alas is no longer with us. The capture of the bridge over the River Troan and the capture of the Merville Battery. The airborne forces at that time consisted of, in total, the first airborne corps which had in it the 1st Airborne Division, who were in the Mediterranean, and the 6th Airborne Division and the 4th Independent Parachute Brigade. The battery consisted of, as we thought, a garrison of 150 people. It had four guns. We thought they were 150 millimeter, but we afterwards discovered that they were not as big as that. They were 100 millimeter. There they are. There was one dual purpose machine gun there, and several ordinary heavy machine guns. There was on this side, as you look at it, an anti-tank ditch, because I imagine they thought we were coming across the beaches and into that way. We, in fact, approached it from the top of that picture as you see it. There were, it was surrounded by a cattle field, a, sorry, a, a cattle fence, then a barbed wire apron fence, then a minefield, then another barbed wire fence. 
And there were, in fact, some mines inside that other one. They are not marked there because <coughs> they were not known at the time, but we found them out. The normal ratio taken at that time of attacker to defender in a fourth situation like that was seven to one. Now remember that figure when I speak later on. I decided that we had to teach the troops and train them down to every last detail. So the brigade major and I flew over the area and we found a place in Berkshire which had a large hill where we could use live ammunition and the Royal Engineers built a replica of the battery down to every detail including <coughs> dummy mines, dummy in that they exploded but nothing was in them to hit people. We carried out nine rehearsals altogether, five by night and four by day, until the men were nearly dropping. We made every man repeat his job. We gave them air photographs of the whole area, the French area. We gave them maps and said, you've been lost here. Describe to me how you're going to get back after you've been dropped. I was very worried about security because I closed all the roads <coughs> around this place and an infuriated retired colonel with grey hair and a very red face, came and told me exactly what he thought of me. And he drank the only bottle of gin I'd got in the officer's mess before lunch. We had lunch and he went away quite happy. I then asked the RAF if they could lend me 12 of their most attractive refs. And I, I had those girls down to West Woodhay in Berkshire and I said, I'm going to let the battalion off to Hungerford and Newbury. And I want you to use any means at your disposal, and I mean any means, to see what you can get out of the men. And if they don't get back till six or seven tomorrow morning, I don't mind. Well, not one man broke his security. Those girls didn't manage to get anything out of them at all. We <coughs> went to the transit camp at Broadwell and we spent about five days there and then we rehearsed the men again and again and again until it was almost impossible to forget where they were or what they were going to do. There are the timings that we were to drop to M plane at half past ten and to drop our Trowbridge party, which in effect was our advance party, who were to drop on the on the zone to mark a rendezvous for the battalion to go to after they dropped, to put the Eureka beakers on the ground, beacons on the ground for the planes. We followed at just before midnight. And in my support, I had a hundred Lancasters, each carrying a 1,000 pound bomb. And they, as you see, dumped their load at half an hour after midnight. We were then on the ground. Unfortunately, and am I, <coughs> those members of the RAF, if there are any present, forgive me, unfortunately they missed the battery with most of the bombs. And they put them on our route the whole way. So that when we eventually started to go towards the battery, we were climbing in and out of enormous holes by the gift of the Royal Air Force. There you see, you can put the pointer on the battery, couldn't you please? There you see the battery with the bombs that hit it 
and there out and around it the bombs that didn't. The casements of those of that battery were six foot of concrete on top and another six foot of earth. Those bombs didn't penetrate, they cracked uh, the concrete of one casement. That gives you some idea of the size of them. I decided that I was going to make four gaps in the wire and that I was going to have three gliders, each carrying 20 men, who would land inside the battery and stop by knocking their wings off against the casement, which I thought might surprise the Germans. I asked a company to form up and I asked for volunteers and the company was 150 odd strong and the whole company stepped forward. So then of course we had some upset men because we had to choose them. And the average age of that battalion was just over 20. I was 29 and I was the second oldest man in the battalion. We took off, as you know, at just after midnight and when I went, <coughs> when I jumped out, I knew that I was not going to land on the dropping zone. I have been told that by people who say they know that there was no anti-aircraft fire. That's rubbish. Uh, there was. The plane I was in was nearly hit. My own parachute was riddled with bullet holes from incendiaries. And so if you hear people saying there was no anti-aircraft fire <coughs> before the, the seaborne troops landed, you can safely contradict them. I landed against a building at the first floor level by a window and dropped onto the ground. And there were some characters looking out of the window and another man, one of my corporals, landed alongside me and he picked up a stone or a brick and he hurled it through the window at the people above and they disappeared. That is at a place called the Moulin du Pré near Varaville. And if any of you are going to Normandy and want a really good restaurant, go there because it is now a pub, a very good pub with one of the two best restaurants in Normandy. I don't have any shares, but the owner is a very great friend. One talks about coincidences. My wife and I were there some years ago, and I said to the owner, Who, uh, there, who's that elderly couple who paying great attention to us? He said, well, when you stopped on the way to the battery, you, you stopped at a farm, and you didn't know it, but there were two children looking out of the window who watched you. It was a bright night and they watched you and they couldn't believe the eyes because there were soldiers in a strange uniform and they didn't know what the British were. And this couple was the owner's father and mother-in-law, which I think is one of the most extraordinary coincidences I've ever met. I made my way towards the, rehearse the rendezvous, discovered that Practically the whole area was flooded. Not the dropping zone, but the fields alongside it. Now, our men, and there's one or two sitting here who took part in that operation, our men were carrying <coughs> their weapons, plus 60 pound kit bags, tied to their right leg with a quick release rope which as they came down, they let go and it hit the ground and it added, acted as a break. But when they went into that water, they hadn't got a hope in hell of getting out. 
I met one of our officers, brigade headquarter officers. We tried to pull men out of that marsh. We couldn't. So a very high proportion of our casualties was due to the, f f the flooding of that particular area and the drowning of those men. When I got to the rendezvous, no, I missed a bit, I'll go back. My batman went through a greenhouse at the back of that building. He'd only got a slight cut, a chap called Joe Wilson, who was a professional boxer and then became a gentleman's gentleman. I don't know how those two relate. So he came round the corner and Leading up to this place, there is a drive, a garden, and a stream. And he came round the corner, and as he went round the corner, he found a German patrol going, doubling down the drive with their weapons like this. So Joe falls in behind them. They didn't notice him. And they went jogging down the drive, all, there were a lot of them. And the, the German patrol turned left, Joe turned right, and went to the rendezvous. And I've never yet managed to meet the officer in charge of those Germans. I met two very elderly Germans with bicycles, sort of home guard chaps. And I stopped them, and in those days I was able to speak reasonable German, and <coughs> asked them what their unit was, and they told me. And they said to me, look, fed up with you Wehrmacht people. You're always doing these exercises in this business, in this area. You dress yourselves up like British troops. Stop it. We're, we don't like it. So I took their rifles, chucked them in the water, chucked their bicycles in the water, and sent them off down the road. I actually hope they survived. When I got to the rendezvous, I asked how many men we had. I was told 100. I was absolutely shattered. I then had the equipment checked. Now there is what we took on the left, and there's what we had on the right. We, had, we took 60 Bangalore torpedoes. How many, hold your hands up, how many people know what a Bangalore torpedo is? Good. So you know that 10 weren't very good. We had one heavy machine gun out of four, six light guns out of nine, no three-inch mortars, no two-inch mortars, no six-pound anti-tank guns, no pits, one radio set, which didn't work, no jeeps, no, nothing. Now, the plan for the attack was, in detail, was as follows. An advance party would go and sit outside the wire and listen for the Germans and mark them by the cigarettes, because we knew that the one big failing the German sentries had was smoking on duty and nobody stopped them. This party consisted of two officers, a couple of warrant officers, and a couple of sergeants. Their job was that, then, having sat outside that wire, was to cut the fence and to defuse the mines that they met and to tape four paths through the minefield for the assault, the two paths through the minefield for the four assault teams. Well, when they got there, they had no tapes, they had no mine detectors. They had be all, in fact. However, Captain Greenway, who was <coughs> one of the officers, crawled through the mines to the inner barbed wire fence, and with a, another man beside him, and they defuse those mines with their fingers. 
they then went back to the cattle fence, turned themselves around, sat down, and shoved themselves on their behinds, dragging their heels through the ground to mark a path. They both got decorated because, in my, to my mind, it was one of the most cold-blooded acts of bravery I've ever met. They only had to put one little finger in one wrong place, and that was goodbye to them. I waited, uh, unbeknown to uh, the powers of B, I had kept a quarter of an hour in my timing as a cushion. I didn't tell anybody. I waited that quarter of an hour, and in that time, another 50 men came in. So I then had 150 men. Now to recap, I had 150 men against a garrison that was supposed to be 150, one to one. And the ratio, as I told you, was six or seven to one accepted in a fortress. I had the Lancasters in support. I also was supposed to have a troop of Royal Engineers to assist in blowing up the guns and, as you saw, anti-tank guns. <coughs> Excuse me. I had no idea whether I had any Royal Engineers or not. They didn't report. I'll tell you why later. I was supposed to have my left flank guarded by a company of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. The company commander didn't report, nobody did. So I really didn't know what to do. However, I reorganized into two parties. And while I was doing this, an officer of the Grenadier Guards who dropped what been dropped wide joined us and he was sitting on a well listening and he disappeared down the well uh, he came back and the stench was appalling we all staggered backwards I later learned that this wasn't a well it was the place where the farmhouse people deposited the results of their lavatories and Bobby had fallen into it. And you can imagine his reaction as a Grenadier Guardsman. <laughs> We'd hardly got over that than I start, heard bolts clicking and the orders were very, very strict. You will not fire until I personally give the order. And we were then charged by a maddened herd, small herd of about 30 or 40 cattle and they went straight through it. It was one of the most terrifying things of my experience in Normandy because although ultimately <coughs> you saw cows but when they came charging down at you didn't know what the hell they were. They knocked over a lot of people and disappeared. We made our way to the battery very slowly very quietly, falling into RAF bomb holes and clambering out again. A German patrol, obviously alerted, passed us and one could have reached out and grabbed them, grabbed them by the ankle, but they did not hear us, they did not smell us, they didn't see us. They just went past us. When we arrived at the battery, <coughs> the Germans woke up. They opened up with everything, including that wretched dual-purpose gun stuck on a post in the middle there. However, uh, the men were were very good. I sent a party round to the main gate as a diversion to try and attract the Germans 
to put all their fire there, and that worked quite well. The one thing that did strike me, that although we were there outside the wire, they, knew, they didn't seem to know exactly where we were. And they didn't concentrate their fire, they didn't send anybody up to the wire to have a look and find out. So we stayed there until the time for attack. We had to be in and out of that battery. In other words, we had to attack it, get in, neutralize the guns. And I emphasize that word neutralize because a lot of people have been critical. So they already didn't pull them all out of all action, out, out of action altogether. One of them fired. But my orders actually said neutralize them. Um, One would have expected the Germans to have taken some proper counter-offensive, counter but no. We had to be out of that battery by half-past five, or HMS Arethusa was going to open up with all its guns, whether they knew we were in there or out of it. So it was essential we kept the timetable. I had an officer with a hunting horn, and I suppose he wouldn't be very popular today, but. Um, he blew his horn at half past four. The ten Bangalore torpedoes blew two gaps and the wire went up. <clears throat> the bridging men, as we call them, went forward. Now the bridging men were the men who fell on the barbed wire like that and their comrades ran up over their back and down the other side. That is something which is, uh, there have been plenty of books written about this thing and I've never seen that mentioned. But it was very effective and I'm glad to say that the men who did it all survived without any damage at all. The assault parties fanned out to the four casements. There, there, there and there, and some, the doors were not shut, some went in through the doors, some went in around the front. Which way did you go, Sid? Where are you? Back or front? Through, through the rear. Uh, anybody from Nine Para here who went around the front? Which way did you go? I was in the glider that crashed landed in the Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the gliders were due to come in as we went attacked. We were due to put up flood lighting by two inch mortar flares. As you saw, we had no two inch mortars. We couldn't do that. It was dark. One glider just before we went in, one glider flew over and landed behind us in an orchard and having caught on fire, they shot it at it with incendiaries. It was commanded by a man called Hugh Pond and he got all the men out of that glider and without any further orders, he used his initiative and formed a defensive position facing towards that wood at the top. And thank God he did, because the German patrol which we had passed on the way up, about 60 men, tried to attack us up the backside, and he stopped them. There was no sign of the other two gliders. So that's where my anti-tank guns were, that's where they went. That's where my Royal Engineers were, in those gliders. That's why I didn't have them. One landed about a mile away, and the other tow rope broke over mid-channel. So there this chap was left in a glider with no power, no means of communication, he turned the thing round, he managed to get 
some upstream. He got it back over the coast. He saw some rights in it, down below him, and that was odium. He landed at odium with his 20 men. He managed to get transport. He got them down to the coast and he got them across to Normandy. And for years, I learned, learned that poor man blamed himself and thought it was his fault. My wife and I were, a few years ago, were invited to annual reunion lunch at 38 Group at Bryce Norton. And this chap, Splatter Squadron Commander, came up to me and told me this story. I then discovered he lived very close to us, so I went to see him. And the relief on his face was incredible. And I only had wished I had known this. He'd carried that burden of guilt, which wasn't guilt, all his life. He was a very brave man, and so was his um, co-pilot. So we are attacking in dark, no flares, two gaps, and we're at the casements. As soon as they realized we were airborne, they shot their hands up and shouted, Camarade. And we took 23 prisoners. Now, I don't know whether any of you have ever tried to blow the barrel of a piece of artillery without heavy explosive and with hand grenades. Well, it's not on. So we took out the firing blocks. We did what damage we could. And the German commander said to me when the BBC took me over a few years ago, Steiner, who was com commanding the battery, but was at his, o his OP by the river, why didn't you cut off the wheels? They're wooden. That's all very well. The, the, the rims of the wheels were wooden. They had steel outside them, but the spokes were steel. So how the hell do you saw those things off in the middle of a battle? And they had no explosive to blow them. At the end of it, we had 23 prisoners, and we had 75 people on our feet. The battery commander said this, and I, I quote if I can find it. Um, Herr Steiner confirmed to the BBC that at the end of the attack by the 9th Parish Battalion, he had only six unwounded men at his disposal from an original garrison strength of 130. In other words, we had put out of action, by one way or another, 124 men. Sorry, 118 men. It was not until the afternoon of the 6th of June that two guns, those in number one and two emplacements, could be got going at the rate of one round every 10 minutes. The normal rate of fire intended to harass the landings on Sword Beach was six rounds per minute by all four guns, i.e. salvos of 24 rounds per minute. My original regiment was the Royal Ulster Rifles. The man commanding the 2nd Battalion, the Royal Ulster Rifles, who were in the first wave, turned around to one of his officers as they landed, and there was no firing, and he said, thank God for 9th Para. I then looked at the prisoners and said, show me the way out. Oh, we don't know. We're not Germans. We're Russians. We're Austrians. They were everything except Germans, they said. So I said, well, it's very unfortunate because this officer, myself, will be walking behind you, and sometimes these Sten guns go off without warning. They could hit your feet. So they showed us the way out through the minefield, 
grumbling. I suppose I could have been court martial for that, but <coughs> that was the only way to get out, because the whole place was churned up. The Germans had opened fire with two defensive batteries. There was machine gun fire at the beginning. There were German shells, and we were scared because we were afraid that the Navy, Royal Navy, was going to open up. I also discovered that in addition to the cruiser, HMS Arethusa, I had a monitor, which was nothing more than a floating platform of 15-inch guns in support as well, but thank God they didn't open up. <coughs> I then counted the casualties, as I said, the 75 on our feet and the remainder of our troops were killed or wounded. They were taken to an agreed regimental aid post with our one doctor and the doctor from the battery. The doctor from the battery went back into the battery to get more medical supplies and was unfortunately killed by his own shelling. I sat down and had some breakfast I told you that the German <coughs> doctor was unfortunately killed by his own fire. Now, I never quite discovered who did all the planning and all the jobs for the 9th Battalion, but whoever it, ever did it at the top was absolutely stark staring bonkers. Because, and I never had the opportunity of saying so to him, because we, we weren't supposed to finish then. They told me that there was a radar station not far away, and I was to go and put it out of action. After that, I was to go to a village called Onfreville, capture it, and if there were any enemy there, kick them out. Well, when I decided we would move off, a Canadian corporal formed up to me and saluted very smartly and said, A Company, 1st Canadian Parish Battalion, sir. And I said, uh, how many men have you, <coughs> have you got? He said, four and myself. That was the company that was supposed to be guarding my left flank. Um, we had 75, so I then had a battalion of 80 men. I, ha I was not able to discover what had happened to the parachuting sailors, who were supposed to be FOBs, and the gunners, who parachuted in to help me. I don't know what happened to them. Anyway, <coughs> we moved off, and we had no sooner left the battery than the United States Air Force paid us a great compliment by dropping umpteen bombs from fortresses within about 100 yards of us. No, I suppose it wasn't their fault. They couldn't see us, but I don't know what the hell they thought they were doing or who they were bombing. The corn was up, and I decided that, we, that I was not going to do anything about this radar place. It was a waste of time. I hadn't got the man, and I hadn't got the inclination. <clears throat> um, those who serve with me know that I'm a bit of a bloody-minded Irishman. And, um, I decided to go to Onfreville and go through the cornfield because I hoped that by so doing we would not be quite so obvious. And a Frenchman farmer came charging down, greeted me, and said he was very pleased to see me, and he imagined that this was the invasion, and he felt I ought to know that Onfreville was occupied by a battalion about 500 strong of Russian soldiers in German uniform with German NCOs and German officers. So you can imagine my feelings then. We went to Envermont and they met us just on the outskirts. We had a bit of a firefight. Now I do not believe that commanding officers of battalions should be out in front getting themselves killed, I think they ought to be where they can command, and if possible, in a ditch. So I was in a ditch. 
and I saw a pair of brown shoes and corduroy trousers, <clears throat> I looked up. There was another Frenchman smoking a pipe, and there were bullets and muck flying all over the place. And he said, good morning, good morning. I do hope when you finish, you'll come in and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> and he was completely imperturbable. My regimental sergeant major was an ex Wodehouse rifleman, and he met a warrant officer from the uh, Germans on the other side of the fence, and he told him, he said, you great big fat bastard, get out of it, I'll blow your guts out. So the chap got out of it. We occupied Entreville. We took a position of a thin red line of literally 80 men at about 10 yards interval. They had snipers there. We woke up the following morning and they'd gone. I then received a wireless message to say that I was to take up position at a place called the Chateau saint Con. We were relieved by number three commando, which was commanded by a chap called Peter Young. Some of you may know, he's dead now. We went by night. We had two farmyard carts. We put German blankets round the horses' hooves. We mounted our one machine gun on one of them. We walked at midnight right through Braville, which was occupied by Germans, they were in the houses. We went right through them. They didn't hear us. We turned right. We went down the, the road towards Pegasus Bridge and we we're about to turn left along a track to come up to the chateau and we heard marching and a couple of companies of Germans with rifles slung on their shoulders marching in threes along this track the NCO calling out left right left right and they knew we were there for God's sake our gliders had landed just down the road and so we stopped we held the horses mu uh, muzzles they didn't make any noise, and the Germans went past, and we stayed on there for a bit, then we moved. I went round to the back of the hill, and up the hill to the Chateau saint Con. Now that ridge overlooks the whole plain which, on which stands Ronville, and onto which goes the Pegasus Bridge. And anybody in possession of that could have literally created hell for the invasion. And they could have put their tanks down and straight over onto the left flank of the main armies. When I got there, I found my second in command, who I had sent on ahead, pacing up and down, smoking a cigarette. And I said, for God's sake, what the hell are you doing? Oh, I didn't think about that, so we d sorted that one out. <coughs> I walked up to a bungalow where I decided to make my battalion headquarters and knocked on the door and a woman put her head out and said, oh, go away. We're fed up with you Wehrmacht people doing your training. The same story as I'd just been told earlier on. When I went into the drawing room, on the piano was a photograph of a British officer in uniform and I said to her, what on earth are you doing with a photograph of Edward Darbo? He said, she said, he's my nephew. And this chap and I had been at Sandhurst together. And she was married. She was a Danish, married to a, a Frenchman. The next day, the Germans started to probe. They started by a platoon, with a platoon, company, battalion, and we're now at the 8th and 9th of June. And eventually, they attacked us with 3,000 men and a squadron of tanks. I think said we called it Bomb Alley, didn't we? Said Capon, where are you? We called it, we called it Bomb Alley, did we not? It's definitely, it's definitely. What's the bomb, are you? 
Terrible place. It was. It worse than Merville. It really was worse than Merville. I, and one of my visits to the Royal, <coughs> to the Regimental Aid Post, RAP, with one doctor, I found 83 casualties, stretcher bearer cases, plus others, British and German. The Germans had so many casualties that we had to go and move their bodies in order that we could get a field of fire. They gave us the impression that they were drugged. They came across the field shoulder to shoulder and chanting. I had made my disposition so that I had a killing field and so they did come into that one field but they never got inside any part of our defensive positions. And we were there until the 13th of <coughs> June. We never got to a battalion strength of more than 270. We were eventually helped by a battalion, the 1st 5th Black Watch, which was sent up to support me and take up such positions as I gave them. We had also a number of glider pilots, one or two RAF. One of my sergeants came in with his full stick with all their weapons and all their ammunition and 20 pay books of German officers of the rank of Brigadier General and above who they had met en route. They had been dropped just over 30 miles inland. So you can see why we were in such a schmozzle at the battery. I, on one day, was stupid enough to get at the wrong end of some German shells and got blown across a lane. Um, we were relieved on, I think from memory, the 13th. And when I reported into the headquarters of the 7th Parish Battalion for more orders, I turned around to look, and what was left of the battalion was sound asleep by the side, on the side of the main road out of Ronville. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of the 9th Battalion.